There are big changes coming to Linux that some people are considering even more controversial than allowing parts of the kernel to be written in Rust. On October 18th, a kernel developer published a message to the Linux kernel mailing list that showed several other kernel developers had been removed from the maintainer's file. The commit message in this patch reads, removed some entries due to various compliance requirements. They can come back in the future if sufficient documentation is provided. Now, if we take a look at the changes that were made to this maintainer's file, the names of the people removed are Russian sounding or at least Eastern European. But the real smoking gun here are the email addresses with the .rutld. Okay, if your name is Dmitry Kozlov and you use mail.ru, you might be a Russian. Now, of course, this vague of an explanation for removing people from the Linux project was not well received. All of the immediate responses right after wanted a better explanation at the very least. And a few days later, one came, replying to a lot of those requests for more details. And the answer essentially was, if the company that you work with is on the US sanctions list, or if it's owned by a company or entity that's on that list, then you cannot be in the maintainer's file. And Linux maintainers will be restricted in their ability to collaborate with you. The de-Russification of Linux was also confirmed by Linus himself in the blunt manner that he is so famous for. His response reads, okay, lots of Russian trolls out and about. It's entirely clear why the change was done. It's not getting reverted and using multiple random anonymous accounts to try and grass root it by Russian troll factories isn't going to change anything. And FYI, for the actual innocent bystanders who aren't troll farm accounts, the various compliance requirements are not just a US thing. If you haven't heard of Russian sanctions yet, you should try and read the news someday. And by news, I don't mean Russian state-sponsored spam. As to sending me a revert patch, please use whatever mush you call brains. I'm Finnish. Did you think I would be supporting Russian aggression? Apparently, it's not just a lack of real news, it's lack of history knowledge too. And then there's some more back and forth, people calling Linus a Nazi, reminding him that Finland sided with Germany in World War II, etc. This isn't the first time in even recent memory that Russian software has had restrictions put on it. Kaspersky suffered a huge blow to their market share starting in 2017 when it was banned from use on government computers. I was actually working part-time at Best Buy when this happened, and Best Buy themselves decided to pull Kaspersky from their shelves. And they even gave customers that had bought Kaspersky in the past through Best Buy the option to convert their paid licenses, I think it was one, two, or three years that came with Geek Squad tech support, something like that. They could convert those antivirus licenses over to Webroot or Trend Micro. And then the sale of Kaspersky was banned flat out in the United States. And now you can't even download the free versions of their software in the United States without Tor or a VPN or some other way to get a Russian friendly IP address. Now, since Kaspersky is a closed source program, which by its nature as an antivirus solution actually needs to run with very high permission levels on your OS and it scans files on your system and it sends information about those files back to Kaspersky lab so that they can update their virus definitions. With all of that in mind, it's really easy to see how that kind of software could potentially be weaponized against Russia's enemies. The Big red flag there being that it's proprietary software. But I also don't think weaponizing Linux is that far-fetched either. You'd think it would be harder because again, Linux is open source and it probably still is harder to weaponize it. But as we've seen with the XZ backdoor, it is still possible for state-backed threat actors to insert malicious code into open source software and have it hiding in plain sight for a long time and nobody notices it. 
But on the flip side, there's also a risk of government control or intervention into these projects being used as another way to infiltrate them. I mean, in a way, that's exactly what's happening here. Because of sanctions coming from the United States and other countries, Russians are being removed from the project. It doesn't seem that far-fetched that code or maintainers could be added in for purposes of national security. And who's to say that those people who do end up having control over the project don't end up being Russian spies themselves? A similar issue could pop up with the RISC-V project as well. This is an open software instruction standard for CPUs that, in principle, should be accessible to anyone, but the US government is trying to limit access to the Chinese government. Lawmakers have been calling RISC-V a US tool and trying to claim that China's use of RISC-V is therefore illegal. Time and time again, we've seen software companies, usually those that develop privacy-centric software, kind of like what happened with Telegram, bend the knee to whatever government they're under the jurisdiction of when enough legal pressure is applied to them. And because this is a legal compliance issue, there's no way that anyone at the Linux Foundation is going to face a fine or jail time in order to keep Russian maintainers on board. It makes me sad to see this happening and to see something as pure as free software and especially the kernel, which I think is one of the greatest expressions of free software, be subject to sanctions and for software to be treated the same as bombs and other kinds of munitions. And the idea of code being classified as munitions is also much older than the current conflict in Ukraine. Some of you might remember the days when browsers and other pieces of software were only allowed to ship with 256-bit SSL domestically in the United States, and then there were international versions of browsers and, and even programming languages. Like I think there were two different versions of Java back in the day that would have usually the same algorithms, but they would be used with much weaker keys like 70-bit instead of 256-bit. I really hope this Russian-Ukraine conflict and the banning of people from the maintainer's file doesn't have permanent negative consequences to international software collaboration in the future. These people that were banned are obviously quite talented. I don't think they would have become maintainers in the first place if they were not. And I could see an event like this pushing developers who maybe aren't actually involved with the Russian war machine or really are not you know, pro-Russia in this conflict being pushed further towards that side. Maybe they'll focus their efforts into developing Astra Linux or one of the other Russian Linux distros. That's actually one of the apolitical silver linings that I think I see to all of this. The fact that Russia and other nations don't trust proprietary operating systems with Western ties like Windows, and really they shouldn't. And this distrust pushes them to develop their own operating systems, usually based on Linux, since even sanctions can't keep people from forking free software. And if those state-backed efforts to improve the OS result in improvements that anyone can use in their Linux distro to make it better, then I think that's a win for everyone regardless of where they're from. Tell me your thoughts in the comments section below. Please like and share this video to hack the algorithm and buy some merch from my website, base.win, where you can save 10% automatically at checkout by paying in Monero XMR. And have a great rest of your day.